Now that we've more fundamentally looked at the ways in which John Rawls grounds his political philosophy, in this lesson we're actually going to start to talk about the application of this grounding, essentially, where we talk about how he constructs the idea of a just liberal society and, and, and constructs a theory of justice. Now, he does so as part of this idea of, quote-unquote, justice as fairness. And we're going to talk about what he means when we when he talks about justice as fairness in this lesson. And we'll talk about the way in which justice as fairness is constructed and then developed in future lessons time as well. So, essentially, we've clearly instantiated the ideas that Rawls has in relation to his construction and his conception of political philosophy more broadly. And now we're going to examine the application of this construction, which is the nature of his theory of justice. We'll begin with what is considerably seen to be the theory of justice in a liberal society as conceptualized by Rawls. And this is sort of codified and sort of uh, reduced down to this idea of quote unquote justice as fairness. And we'll explain the idea of justice as fairness and we'll uh, explain the key components of justice as fairness in this lesson. So. According to John Rawls, the only moral acceptability for the basis of the use of political power is this idea of legitimacy. So when we talk about the legitimate use of political power, that is the only way in which it is morally acceptable to utilise political power for any kind of purpose, if it is legitimate to do so, if there is a certain amount of legitimacy in doing so. And the result of that is that justice as fairness is intended to provide a standard for making determinations as to whether or not a political action or the use of political power is legitimate. So we're talking about the legitimacy of political action and political power and the ways. So on the one hand, Rawls says that if it is not legitimate, if it is illegitimate, then there is no moral acceptability in providing any kind of basis for it. And in order to determine whether or not it is legitimate or not legitimate, we have to think about justice as fairness. Now, in constructing this idea of justice as fairness, what Rawls looks to examine is the most appropriate ways to understand and then to interpret which may exist, uh, the tension, sorry, which may exist within the liberal society. And we talked in previous lessons about, for example, the tension that exists between this idea of freedom and this idea of equality. In formulating justice as fairness, Rawls looks to describe what he believes to be the most just arrangement for major political and social institutions. So he's not talking about the most utopic uh, method by which we understand uh, political institutions and social institutions. He's talking about the most fair, the most just and fair arrangement, okay, that, that takes into account the best circumstances uh, uh, humanly possible as well as reducing the tensions insofar as possible. And he then describes this as the basic structure. So within justice as fairness, the idea itself, we have two major principles which Rawls understands and takes to be true for a liberal society. He believes that on the one hand, each person has the same indefeasible claim to a fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties, which a scheme is compatible um, with the same scheme uh, of liberties for all. And I've cited here this idea of uh, the, the, the citation here is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So this is the first major principle. And then we have the second major principle and that the the second major principle is that social and economic inequalities are to satisfy two conditions so he accepts that there can be inequalities that exist within society socioeconomic inequalities but those socioeconomic inequalities are to satisfy two conditions they are to be attached to offices and positions open to all under the conditions of fair equality of opportunity and then secondly they are to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. This is taken from pages 42 and 43 of A Theory of Justice. This is the idea of the difference principle. We'll get into the difference principle in a second. 
This is justice as fairness. It is made up of two basic principles. The second principle has two subsets. The first principle is that each person has the same indefeasible claim to a fully adequate scheme of all basic liberties, which scheme is, and this scheme is compatible with the same scheme of liberties for all. That's part one. Part two is that where there exists inequalities between um, either social or economic, and when I talk about inequalities, we're not necessarily referring to the colloquial understanding of inequalities in the sense that we're talking about a major injustice in the sense that there is inequality. We're talking literally about the fact that there are two people who may not be equal. Okay, whether economically or socially. So there may be two people who earn different amounts of money from their jobs. That is considered to be an economic inequality. He says that those can be satisfied if they are either, or, or both, sorry, if they are A, uh, attached to offices and positions which are open to all under conditions of the fair equality of opportunity, and then B, they are to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. This is the difference principle. So, the first codifies this idea of the fair equality of opportunity. So if you have two, uh, if you have two people who have two different uh, sets of socioeconomic conditions, they are unequal. One may be more satisfied than the other. It's okay because they are still open to conditions of the fair equality of opportunity. Either of them had the complete fair equality of opportunity to reach that higher position of inequality of equality if of economic uh, satisfaction shall we say and then secondly they are to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society this instills this idea of a distributive system of justice okay we can have inequalities but we're going to try and benefit to the greatest extent the least advantaged members of this society and it is said that essentially the first principle is something which ought to be embodied and entrenched as a system of regulation. So, for example, the second, the first principle should be something that is enshrined within the political constitution of a society and could be enshrined within the legal constitution of a society. The idea of human rights, for example, uh, aligns quite closely with this first principle. And then downstream from the first principle is the second principle, which essentially acts to codify and to provide the practical application of the first principle. If we go back to these principles, the second principle is more practical. It enshrines the equality, fair equality of opportunity, as well as the difference principle. And essentially what the second principle is doing is applying the first principle. The first principle is giving a general, generalized, theorized understanding. And then the second principle is talking about how we can actually achieve that understanding. As part of a justice of fairness, we get this quote. We say that in all parts of society, there are to be roughly the same prospects of culture and achievement for those similarly motivated and endowed. So what Rawls is enshrining here is the fair equality of opportunity, not necessarily the, op uh, the equality of outcome. Rawls is perfectly happy with having a system in the society that is potentially slightly unjust that has slight inequalities but in terms not unjust sorry that has slight inequalities between different members and different groups of society where it isn't exactly the same where everybody isn't uh, don't have the complete equality of outcome because so long as everybody had the opportunity to be uh, within uh, to achieve whatever within a society okay given the fact that they are similarly motivated and endowed to do so then that is what really constitutes a just uh, democratic society. So I said we'll come back to the difference principle, and let's do that now. Um, the difference principle is the second part of the second principle of the justice as fairness, the idea that it should be to the, to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged. Now, what does this provide is essentially a blueprint for the most just distribution of resources within society. And so what the difference principle tells us is that it does accept that there may be inequalities with regard to wealth and income. OK, this is part of this idea of a practical application of society. Rawls was not a pure egalitarian in this regard, but that these inequalities must only be justified on the basis that they advantage those who are worse off. Hence why we get the view that they are justified if and only if they provide the greatest advantage to those who are advantaged least. 
And so the result of this, the result of having and applying a difference principle is this idea of distributive justice, distributing resources to benefit the to have the greatest advantage to the to the to those who are advantaged least. So the purpose of the difference principle within the justice within justice as fairness is to essentially satisfy the basis of all within a society. An economy must essentially work to the benefit of all. So in justice as fairness, men agree to share another's fate. That is another principle and quote from a justice as fairness, uh, from a theory of justice, should I say. And this really brings us to the next question. Because what we're going to do in the next question is talk about, okay, this is giving us a blueprint for how a just society actually operates. But what are the principles? Okay, we have the difference principle. We have a view that, um, you know, we should, we should, it should be the, the greatest benefit of the least advantage. That's perfectly fine. We can understand that to be the case. We have the idea of the fair equality of opportunity. And we have the idea of the basic liberties. Okay. But we still haven't constructed practically what this society is going to look like. How is it going to look? What are these liberties that we see in the first principle? Well, that is what Rawls then goes to when he starts to talk about the original position. And then we're going to start to talk about the original position in the next lesson.